from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Keeping a Cajun tradition going. We head to Louisiana where one man is keeping the art of duck calling alive. Getting water to where it's needed the most. If the soil pH has been acid too long, uh, we can uh, basically destroy soil structure. Some advice to help keep water moving and prevent acids from impacting what's underground as we help you flip your soil and a check on planting across the country and in the Hoosier State. I'm Michelle Rook here in Indiana where Plant 2023 is officially on. Our planters finally getting the upper hand right now on Ag Day. Good morning. Planting is starting at a lightning pace in some portions of the country while in others it hasn't even started. The USDA keeping us updated with the latest crop progress report. It says right now 26% of the corn crop is planted. That's right on par with the five-year average in Missouri. 80% of the corn crop is in the ground, almost double the average pace, while in North Dakota nothing is planted just yet, and just 1% in South Dakota. Meanwhile, 19% of the soybean crop is in the ground, that's 8% ahead of average. Now the calendar might say May, but soil temperatures have struggled to get above 50 degrees across many areas of the Corn Belt to allow optimal corn planting. As Ag Day's Michelle Rook reports, that hasn't slowed down many farmers who decided to plant soybeans first. In fact, it seems to be the trend this spring in Indiana is no exception. It's been a cold spring here in Indiana, but the planters are starting to roll and farmers are making good progress on both corn and soybean planting. South of Lafayette, Chuck Shelby says air and soil temperatures have been unusually cold for this time of year. We've had uh, multiple days of frost and temperatures as low as 26 in the morning. So it's a little bit concerning, but as long as we don't get uh, big heavy rains, I think uh, uh, we're going to continue to plant. However, they decided to plant beans first. In fact, they're nearly done planting beans while they've just gotten a good start on corn. And he's not alone. That seems to be a trend. If you look at the planting progress, it's showing that too. So I think farmers have picked up on the idea. That they think planting beans uh, will handle the cold conditions better than corn will, as far as germination goes. While Shelby says there is a risk of beans emerging and getting hit by frost, he's been planting beans early the last several years using a seed treatment for below ground insect protection. And when it works, he gets a yield bump. If you look at studies on yield, earlier planted beans do, do well if they can get a good start because they have more daylight and soybeans like daylight and that tends to you know, allow for a better yield over time. While the cold is slow planting in central and northern Indiana, the recent crop progress report actually shows both corn and soybean planting ahead of average for the state. We farm some uh, farms south of where I live here and a lot of farmers planted corn last week down in that heavy area in that area. So it's area by area what guys are doing. You go down in southern Indiana, Illinois, there's farmers that are completely done with everything. So it's just location and conditions of the soil. And while he doesn't want a heavy rain with these cold soils, he says the fields at his home farm are dry, which is a concern. We were dry last year. We did get some soil moisture, but a lot of dust flying today when we're out in the field. So because it's cool, we're not losing a lot of moisture in the air, but it wouldn't bother me to have a half inch or three quarters inch of rain. Beyond that, Shelby is optimistic about the growing season from a yield standpoint, but profitability is still a question mark. While many inputs have dropped in price this spring, many farmers missed out. We've seen uh, nitrogen soften up, but most guys had bought, uh, pre-bought their nitrogen. But a lot of end users or those folks that sell to farmers had already bought their, their nitrogen and P and K. So it really has come down a little bit, but I think for most guys it's not uh, dropped as much as the market indicates. Maybe that will be going on in 24 or be a lot cheaper. Plus, last spring, new crop grain prices were much higher, allowing them to offset input costs and make a profit. The saving grace is strong crop insurance price guarantees will help. In Indiana, I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Smithfield Foods appears to be closing 37 sow farms. TV station KTVO reporting an employee told the TV station that Smithfield is closing its sow farms in Putnam and Mercer counties in northern Missouri. Meetingplace.com says Smithfield has 132 company-owned farms and 109 contract farms in Missouri. The unnamed employee telling the TV station that the company's president blamed the move on, quote, 
challenging hog market conditions, end quote. Porkbusiness.com reports the company told producers there are significantly more open positions at Smithfield than there are individuals impacted by the actions taken in the Missouri hog producing region. There's a new agreement between the EU and Ukraine as the country works to export grain beyond its own borders. Following a standoff with the 27-nation EU bloc, Ukraine is welcoming a deal to keep farm exports flowing to world markets. Now, five countries say excess grain from Ukraine crashed their own local prices for farmers. Now a new deal lets Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania restrict some ag products from local markets while still allowing the grain to travel to global ports for shipment to the Middle East and Africa. Producers in the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley may have to keep a watch on temperatures for a while. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joins us with more. Yeah, Clint, when we talk about to the next couple of days across the nation, the big theme is going to be the cold airs. The blocking pattern that's set up across the nation is leaving a good portion of the Midwest uh, down in the basement in regards to our temperatures. We just have to hold on. Uh, May 6th uh, through the 10th, things shift back to the warmer uh, as we get uh, back into the middle part, late stages uh, in the middle part of May and late stages of this week as we're expecting above average high temperatures. But like what we saw last week, where we're above average, we're going to be below average once again on the West Coast. And right in between these two systems is where some of that rain can kick up. So here's a look at what we have with the uh, temperature uh, forecast for this afternoon. There's that pocket of cold air back into Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. That's going to be moving to the northeast and will quickly flip over to some warmer than average high temperatures by Thursday, Friday. That also includes our overnight lows that will start to come back up as well. So I'm not expecting now this to last that long, that cold air to stick around all that long. Temperatures, in fact, will be warming up as we get later in the work week and especially into the weekend. Now, that being said, this is well worth celebrating. Mark uh, Dilmer's uh, father, Richard, recently celebrating his 76th birthday. Uh, Mark says in celebration they got him a 1957 John Deere 720 diesel. It's just like the one dad learned to drive when he was 10 years old. That's what he says. It was a dream of his father's to have one of them again. And you can tell he loves driving it. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Flip Your Soil on Ag Day is brought to you by Economics. Economics is the go-to resource to keep your soil and bottom line as healthy as possible. Access one-of-a-kind tools, research, and agronomy content at Nutrien-Economics.com. This week, we are sharing advice to help farmers flip their soil in an effort to improve yield and productivity. One of the ways is through improved water infiltration. Now, Farm Journal field agronomist Ken Ferry says there are many tools farmers can use to allow water to get into the root zone, but it starts with changing the soil pH. Because even, uh, even if we have a heavy soil, if the soil pH has been acid too long, uh, we can um, basically destroy soil structure and we get the soil running together. So in that case, it's going to be some source of calcium to help us flocculate that clay back together. So uh, in most cases here in the Midwest, it would be calcium carbonate, it would be limestone because we need to fix acidity at the same time. Other areas, it would be gypsum, where they don't have a pH issue. They just need calcium to help put the, the clay back together into that crumb structure. Now, Ferry says farmers can also plant cover crops. And cover crops will definitely step up your infiltration rate and move water through your soil profile because of uh, the ability to kind of catch that water and, and get it to percolate in before it starts to run off. We get to a sandier soil. Um, while we have good infiltration rates on some of the sand, uh, we still have runoff issues on the sand, so situation, but there's not, uh, there's not anything we can do from a calcium standpoint to make a sand good crumb structure. He says no-till also improves water infiltration because it fosters higher populations of night crawlers that bore into the soil and leave channels for that water to move down into the root zone. Wheat and livestock markets start the week under pressure. We have details coming up next in analysis and later, a tradition of craftsmanship. Meet a man making cane duck calls in Louisiana the same way generations before him did today in the country. Soybeans finally making some gains to start the week while wheat had a pretty tough day. Michelle Rook is back to talk with Dwayne Bossy of Bolt Marketing in Markets Now. 
A mixed day in the grains on Monday, as we did see wheat and corn lower and soybeans to the plus side. Dwayne Bussey is joining us with Bolt Marketing. And Dwayne, let's talk about uh, the wheat market. Certainly more new contract lows as we had a risk off day, but weather was another part of that story, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. We got some more moisture coming to the Southern Plains. And this time, instead of hitting Southwest Kansas, it looks like the Eastern part of Kansas is gonna get hit by some rains, which they sure needed there. And that's where the crop was still pretty good. So uh, that kind of led the market lower this morning. No doubt that spilled over into the corn market. And now we find out that the funds are actually short in corn. Are they gonna continue to push that short position there even further short? You know, they might, Michelle, there's really no bullish news in the corn market right now. You know, we're not going to have delayed planting as a story. I think next week you come in at this time, I think we're going to find out half the corn's planted. It's almost all planted in the United States. You know, the only lag will probably be North Dakota. And if you get half the corn crop planted before the second week in May, you can start talking above trend line yields. And right now, just a lack of a bullish story in the corn market probably makes those funds sell even more, like you said. Yeah, and we did take out some critical support areas last week on the charts. Now, soybeans actually held up pretty decent last week, holding some support areas. Is that one of the reasons why soybeans were able to actually bounce on Monday was just we had a little more technical momentum or is the fundamental picture a little more bullish there? I think a little bit of both. Like you said, last week we held some support levels, bounced off a little bit. Yesterday we kind of rallied into the close. Market looks kind of strong from the chart pattern. It looks very good, but also the fundamentals are a bit of a more bullish story when it comes to the soybean market. Old crop situation is tight. Now, yes, export demand is slowing down, but we had really solid exports earlier. And we don't have the huge old crop supplies to be able to go export anymore. So if Brazil's cash market finds some support this week, our soybean market probably will find support as well. Right. And if weather stays decent, obviously, maybe more acres of corn, maybe a few less acres of beans into the mix. Right. I was thinking that same thing, too. A little bit threatening there. Soybeans really don't have the situation to lose acres this year. So it's going to have to stay up a little bit for those November beans. All right. Thanks for your analysis. Dwayne Bussey with Bolt Marketing. And that is a look at markets. Go to my Markets Now podcast for more information. And we'll have more Ag Day coming up. For marketing advice, call Bolt Marketing, a futures and options brokerage firm. Ag Day is brought to you by Lamar's Toy Store, the largest and most diversified farm toy store in the U.S. They have new and old and do restorations and customizations, too. You need to see it to believe it. Visit LamarsToyStore.com or call us at 712-546-4305. We started talking about uh, earlier in the show, talking about the blocking pattern setting up across the United States. Uh, officially, it's called an, an omega block because it's shaped like the Greek letter omega. But what that means is we're getting the colder temperatures. We're not getting much in the way of significant rainfall. Now, there is going to be some rain as the system moves out to the north and east. But back here to the west, it's going to take until the middle part of the week when things start to flip back to the warmer for the rain to start to show up now back into the Midwest. Uh, that does include portions of Texas and into the Dakotas back up here a little bit into the north. Uh, but that being said, the Omega block, what it is doing, what's it do, what it's doing is setting up the colder, if not cool air to the northeast and then a quiet pattern as we transition from that blocking pattern to a warmer than average one uh, coming in by Thursday, Friday and Saturday uh, through the plains. Now, in terms of significant rainfall, you see there is going to be some flooding potential as we get into Wednesday and Thursday. Again, that time frame uh, is very important uh, where we could see some heavier rainfall come through going from the cold air. We're watching those overnight lows drop down below freezing and portions of the nation uh, to some warmer than average highs and lows. That transition coming with possibility of some heavier downpours. Again, that's going to be on Thursday with about a 5 to 15 percent a uh, chance of seeing some flooding across those locations that does include Missouri. As for the severe weather threat, I don't have much in the way of a few tornadoes or damaging winds. This overall pattern is uh, pretty quiet once this system uh, breaks down or this pattern starts to break down. So there's the blocking or they should say low pressure system and the blocking pattern. You will mega block and right underneath this ridge is where things are not only going to quiet down, but warm up as well. So this low moves out. 
high pressure builds in across a good portion of the United States and you'll hear more about that warm up the next couple of days. Start off with Lincoln, Nebraska, sunny high around 69 degrees, low of 35 and sunny. A little windy, uh, Fairfield high of 62 degrees, low of 35. And let's go over to Virginia, Rocky Mount, partly cloudy, high around 64 degrees. For the third time this year, producers will be getting a dairy margin coverage payment. The DMC income over feed costs for March was 619 per hundredweight. That's the lowest level since August of 2021. Now, producers with coverage of 950 per hundredweight will receive indemnity payments of just over $2,500 for each 1 million pounds enrolled. DMC payments have been triggered each month this year with a national average margin at 794 per hundredweight in January and 619 per hundredweight in February. Now, Phil Ploward, the president of Ever.Ag Insights, says the margin picture for this year continues to look weaker than what we saw a year ago. There is a new face for the gut milk campaign. Have you ever looked at a tree and thought, can I drink this? I did. It's actress Aubrey Plaza mocking plant-based milk alternatives with a fake brand in this ad called Wood Milk. The White Lotus star even saying she's the co-founder of the so-called Wood Milk. The ad has its own website where you can even get the t-shirt. There's also the disclaimer, is wood milk real? And the answer is no, only real milk is real. But the Got Milk campaign is pledging to plant 10,000 trees in partnership with One Tree Planting. Up next, a handmade tradition continues in Louisiana. Meet a man helping craft the call of the wild with cane duck calls in the country. In the Country on Ag Day is brought to you by Pivot Bio. What if you had the nitrogen you need already on seed? Pivot Bio is the first company to apply nitrogen on seed. The nitrogen you need, now on seed from Pivot Bio. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Duck hunting is a Louisiana tradition that goes back to when cages first settled the area, and so is making the duck calls that bring ducks in. As this week in Louisiana agriculture's Neil Melanson reports one man in the state is keeping the old ways alive. For Dale Bordelon, when it comes to duck calls, louder isn't always better. Here in a shop, fine-tuning his own handmade calls is a lot like finding the right tool for the right job. Like this old Tommy told me, anybody can kill a duck, anybody can call a duck to 50 yards, but it's from there to lightning that takes a duck caller. And you gotta have a soft call to I mean, ducks working, we're to fine tune them. Not only does he make the duck calls, but pretty much everything else. He makes the P-Rows like this one and the oars that he paddles out in. Even more, he makes these molds he crafts the calls with and these knives he uses to carve. So this is how I make my soundboards. I pull it all together and I take the smooth in, smooth it out. Take my sandpaper and I sand it down. And I end up with a perfect dial pin. It's all round on one side. Dale spent most of his career working for a nearby grain elevator. However, his passion has always been duck hunting, and over the last 30 years, he's made a career out of it. I built them like they, you know, did in the 1800s. So, so I, I didn't plan on nothing. I just started making calls, and people, I, people did. Uh, I had a few. Uh, magazine articles and uh, podcasts and they just kind of took off and then people got a hold of them and then other people seen. So it's just kind of a word of my deal and now I'm doing this full time so that's a job. I got a job and I got my son helping me. Dale makes his duck calls using river cane which is different than bamboo. It grows best under forest canopies on river banks and has a unique property that makes it ideal for Dale's calls. This is a carpet bamboo versus a river cane. See that river cane, how small? You talk about strong. You can't hardly split that river cane. For Dale, it's much more than just working with his hands on a hobby. It's about the preservation of a culture that's been handed down since Cajuns first came to Louisiana. The passion for his craft, he says, comes from knowing it will survive another generation. I love doing it. And the biggest thing of all, I love sharing my Louisiana heritage. That means a lot to me. So I'm, if I could just stay healthy, like them old people, I'd be happy to, to keep this going. <laughs> oh, 
All right, thanks, Neil, and thanks to This Week in Louisiana Agriculture for sharing that story with us. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Day and Clinton Rivers. Have a great day out in farm country.